We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Let's give it up for our moms, huh? Again, on behalf of all of our, our overseers, our staff, our everyone, I just want you to know how much we appreciate our moms. In fact, we got something really special planned for this morning. Uh, we're going to have, uh, we're, instead of hearing mostly from me, we're going to hear from some moms in the room, which I'm really excited about. How many of you have been to a professional NBA game before? Right, you know that at the very beginning of the NBA game, there's a moment where they tell you who the, the heroes are of the moment, right? They announce the starters, and they go all out to make sure you're really excited to know who those heroes are of the moment. And so I think because moms are pretty stinking amazing, we could do something as cool as that to introduce the moms for our Mother's Day panel. This was a bit of a surprise to them first service, but here's what I want you to do. I want us to welcome our mothers onto stage in style. So put your hands together, get up on your feet, let's do this. Come on, come on, come on. And now, your 2023 World Champion Mother's Day panel. This special mom hails from the small but mighty state of Delaware. She is the mother of three girls ranging from elementary to high school. When she's not homeschooling in the mornings, you can find her in her minivan taking children all the places that they go. She's been at ACC since 2015 and is married to Pastor Matt, earning her endless rewards in heaven. Please welcome Melissa Austin. Next up, this special mother comes to us via Trinidad. She is the mother of an adult daughter and the grandmother of three, which makes her the oldest participant on our panel. But that is none of your business. When not at the gym, she enjoys being the grandmother and traveling the world with others. She has been at ACC since the very beginning because we've never wanted to trade her to another team. Please welcome Sheila Jane. Our next special mom is from the booming metropolis of the mother of one elementary age girl who is almost as tall as she is. Less than a foot to go. When she is not watering plants, she can be found at the store buying more plants. She's been at ACC for almost three years now and is married to Pastor Mike, who has to work out every day to keep off the weight from her delicious cooking, please welcome Michelle Miller. And finally, our next mother also comes to us from this area. She is the mother of three girls ages 14, 11, and 7. When she's not making gluten-free food taste amazing, she can be found enjoying coffee with friends, which is always much needed after spending time with your children upstairs. She has been at ACC since 2003, where she settled. 
I mean married Pastor Mac. Please help me welcome Chess That was fun. We surprised our ladies with that at the last service. They had no idea. I'm like, you'll know when to come up on stage. <laughs> It'll be cool. Well, I want you to understand one of the reasons we decided to introduce our moms this way. And uh, our panel only has four moms on it, but there are moms all over this room that deserve that same kind of hero's introduction and welcome because you guys are amazing. There's a verse in Proverbs 31. Actually, the last one, verse 31, says, reward her for all that she has done. And man, standing up and putting our hands together like that, jumping around, moving some lights around, uh, that's one of the small ways that we want to reward you all for the work that you do and for all the mothers in this room. You are amazing. And so we're, we're going to start with that kind of uh, fun energy, but let me, let me get real for just a second. I recognize that every time we have a Mother's Day, it's a very difficult day for some, for most you know, it's a really exciting day. It's a day that you look forward to. But for many in this room, maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've lost your mother. Maybe you've struggled with infertility for years now and you've been trying to have a baby of your own and it just hasn't happened. Maybe uh, for, for whatever reason, you didn't have a mother figure in your life that was really a great mother. And you just look at this whole day and it's a confusing day for you. And so from that perspective, I want to open in prayer and just pray a prayer of comfort over any of you in this room that might be struggling today. Melissa, would you mind actually praying for me? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, God, and we want to uh, recognize the fact that there are so many women in here, God, that are hurting. Um, we don't know the, specific, the specifics of everyone's journey and past, God, but you do personally. So God, we ask right now that your Holy Spirit would come and just be a comfort to each one of them. God, especially on this day, surround them um, with your love and your peace. We know that it truly is only your peace, God, um, that is true peace. So God, I ask right now for any woman in here that is hurting, God, help her to uh, hear your truth, um, speak your truth to her uh, right now the truth that she is loved by you. She is loved by so many. God, the truth that you have an amazing plan for her life. God, the truth that um, you are working all things together for her good and for your glory. God, even through the pain, um, just comfort them. We lift them up and we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. And so one of the things I want to discuss today, really every Mother's Day, we're kind of doing a one-off. We're starting a new series next week going through the book of Ephesians. But today I just want to focus on encouraging uh, our moms. And one of the things that I, I learned is that one of the overarching, maybe the strongest overarching struggle that moms experience is this thing called mother shame. And let me explain what it is. It's a shame that moms sometimes feel when they feel like they're not enough, they didn't spend enough time, they didn't go to enough games, they didn't write enough cards, they didn't say enough words, they didn't, uh, they were not crafty enough, they're not enough, they're not enough. And all these, these things kind of add up, and sometimes what it does is it leaves moms feeling like they're inadequate or insufficient, or that somebody else could be doing the job better than they could. And so I want to encourage our moms today with this one kind of overarching two words, which is this. Ordinary days. Ordinary days. And here's what, I, here's what I mean by that. The mom that you are, on those in-between moments, those, those moments when the camera's not on, there's no one recording, there's no one posting on social media, just the mom that you are on those ordinary days, those are the moments that add up and really matter. And so when I see the moms on this stage and I see the moms in this room, I'm telling you, it's the ordinary days that really matter. And so I want to start a conversation. Jess, does that uh, concept of shame or not enough, does that, does that re uh, re you know, make sense to you? It resonates every single day. Um, as a mom, 
you want to do things perfectly for your children. I know that I want to love my children perfectly. I want to teach my children perfectly. I want to give them the things that are right and good for them perfectly. And I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I mess up time and time again. And so the pressure that I put on myself is based on my desire, um, knowing that raising my children is one of, if not the most important things that I will ever do with my life. And so the, um, the desire to do that perfectly is strong. And so I think one of the, um, one of the things in error, my error, is that I put that perfection um, on me when God doesn't require me to be perfect. He just requires me to be committed. And so for sure, that's something that I struggle with. Hmm. Sheila, how would you say that those feelings sometimes lead to shame or feelings of inadequacy? Um, for me, raising my daughter and being a stay-at-home mom, um, I felt like, isn't there something better that I could be doing, or um, I'm not good enough? Um, everybody else is working outside the home, doing so much more, and I compare my inside to what I was seeing outside with everybody outside, so that really put a lot of shame on me at that time. Yeah, isn't it amazing how if you choose to stay home, you feel shame that you're not out, and if you're out, you feel shame that you're not in, and it's just this, this re recurring cycle I've, I've noticed uh, from the research I've done that in motherhood, it's always this feeling of, of, of being not enough and this, this, this mother shame thing, and, and so what I wanted to do is really just encourage this morning, there's a... Um, there's a passage in Proverbs 31, uh, verse 29, and it says this, there are many virtuous and capable women in this world. By the way, I know that to be true because I'm the pastor of this church. There are many virtuous and capable women in this church. But then the verse goes on, it says, but you surpass them all. What an incredible compliment for someone to say about you, right? There's incredible women all over the place, but you, darling, like you're, you're better than all of them. And I, I'm thinking, like, what does it take when you read Proverbs 31, when you read other verses in Scripture, what does it take to, to be a mother who's surpassing, who's, who's excelling, who's winning in this, this, this thing? And what you're going to find is that the ordinary days are the days that matter. To earn that title, it's the small things that matter. And so when I'm putting this message together, and I'm, ladies, I'm really thankful that you're going to help me teach this this morning, what we found in Scripture was four roles of a mother that matter on ordinary days, all right? Four things that are really hard to capture in an Instagram post, they're really hard to take a picture of, but boy, do they matter in the ordinary days. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And what this verse reminds us of, and mothers, the encouragement to you, those little things that you do each day, they might not seem like much. It just seems like another little thing, another little 24-hour period. But those 24-hour periods of time, they add up and they build up and they create something amazing if you continue to do those things, take those ordinary days with excellence. And it says that at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing. And that's so true, isn't it? And so real fast, before we get into these four things and share them with everyone, uh, a little disclaimer. If you're on this panel today and you are an imperfect mother, would you raise your hand for everyone? <laughs> All right. Uh, let me just be real clear. If you're in this room and you're an imperfect mother, would you raise your hand? If you're uh, an even farther imperfect father, will you raise your hand? Here's, here's, the, here's the deal. All of us in this room, we're really imperfect people. We're really kind of, we got our own junk and our baggage, and we can try to do these things, these roles that we're going to talk about today, and we're going to try to do them with excellence, but we're going to fail, Right? And uh, one of the things, though, I want to just be really clear about, the purpose of this message today isn't to say to the mothers of this panel or to the mothers of this room, 
here's what you ought to be doing better. It is instead to encourage you because I already see you doing these things. And it's just a reminder, an encouraging reminder that these are the things that you're doing that really matter, that really add up. And so as we look at those four roles that matter on ordinary days, we're going to start with the first one, probably the most important one. The role of a mother we find in scripture is to love, to, simply to love. Jess, would you mind reading John 16, verse 21? A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So I wasn't there, but I assumed that the process of giving birth to your three children was not easy. No, it wasn't. That was a good guess. <laughs> uh, would you explain for us how you see that, that, that pain turning into love? How, how does that work? Yeah, I think... Um, the pain is only momentary compared to the joy that you feel holding that baby. And I remember vividly each of my girls um, at some wee hour of the night up with them, holding them, and um, just being in awe of the love that I have for them and the love that, um, that I would give my life for them um, in a way that, you know, Jesus did for us, but in a, in a perfect way. And to know that um, holding those sweet babies, even seeing them today, and probably when they're a little bit sassy, you're like, oh yeah, that sweet little baby, let me go back to that memory. Um, but finding joy in, in that so much, and, and not only how much I love them in my imperfectness, but how much God loves them in his perfectness, and that just blows me away. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I think I've, I've seen is in Scripture, there's uh, multiple words that are, in the Greek, they're different words, but in English, they're all translated to the word love. And so when we read love in, in English in the Bible, we have to kind of wonder, well, which, which version of love are we talking about according to the Greek, uh, you know, original writings? And there's one word that's translated to love, and it's the word agape, and agape love, what it really means is unconditional love. It's the kind of love that God has for you. It's the kind of love that God has for each of us. It's unconditional. There's nothing we can do to change it. And one of the things I think is really powerful about motherhood, uh, from my perspective as a father, I think the closest anyone will ever get to understanding agape love, this side of heaven, is the love a mother has for her children. And I, I say that as a father, and I, I believe I unconditionally love my, my kids, but when I see the way God has made mothers and the unique gifting and the, the, this, the, the way that mothers have been created by God, that process of even bringing them into this world, there's something special about that kind of love. And um, Jess, I'm wondering how, how does your love for your children play out? Uh, how does that unconditionally look? on a daily basis? Well, it's not fancy. Um, and it is continually um, loving them. It is turning my heart towards God um, each and every day because raising kids is hard. Being a mom is hard. It's the hardest thing that uh, I have ever done. And it's a refining process for me. And so knowing that um, our lovely teenager still needs love, even though she acts like she doesn't. Um, it's knowing that the way that my, our, our middle daughter receives love is she, she likes gifts. And so when we're away, um, we'll bring her back something because that makes her feel loved. And so it's, it's giving them love in a way that they receive it. Our youngest loves to cuddle with us. And so we'll spend time cuddling on the couch. And, and it's not anything grand. And I think the idea of ordinary days, it's I'm tired. I don't want to make breakfast, <laughs> but I have to, you know, and it's, it's those acts of service and those acts of love um, that might not look like much, but they are that unconditional love. Hmm. I think of a verse in 1 Corinthians 13. I'll put it on the screen. It's, a, it's called the love chapter, verses just four through six. It says, love is patient and kind. Love do, is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, 
and endures through every circumstance. And when I hear you guys, you all talk about love and the love, Jesse, you're sharing uh, that you have for your children, this is the kind of love we're talking about. It's, it's love that endures, right? It's, it's, uh, it's that agape sort of unconditional love that we show to our children. Um, Michelle, would you mind sharing a story with us about how you've seen this love in your relationship with your daughter? Yes, so after the p- pandemic had started, I had taken the opportunity to homeschool Maddie. And I thought maybe I could just take this on, but Lord knows, gosh, I failed that tremendously. She's now in public school, but with that, with this scripture, I feel like the key ingredient to being a mom in general is having patience. Um, and during that homeschool days, whether she wasn't getting it or I had to te- tell her so many times, like, gosh, these sight words are killing me. And just even like repeating it over and over and teaching her until she got it. You know, that scripture says love never gives up. And in return, she was so patient with me. She was so kind and loving. And it's just like, it amazes me how you, you know, show that to your kid, but in return, they give that back to you. And it just, it warms my heart knowing that, man, I'm doing something right. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Let me, let me give you the next role. We're talking about four roles that matter on ordinary days. The second one that you'll find in scripture uh, is caring, to care. If a mother wants to love well and, and be a great mother on the ordinary days, one of the ways she can do that is obviously showing love. The second way is showing care. And here's what I mean by care that we, we read about in scripture. It's caring for our children's emotional and physical needs. Just the real practical needs that our children have. One of the ways that mothers are great showing love, way better in many ways than fathers, is by caring for their emotional and physical needs. And so with that in mind, Melissa, would you read Psalm 127, verse 3? Sure. Uh, It says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Yeah, so this concept of children being a gift from God, your version of scripture might actually say, that children are a heritage from the Lord, that, they're, uh, that, uh, that there's something really special about this gift that God has given. I don't know about you, but anyone in this room ever, uh, are you known in your family for losing things all the time, leaving things somewhere? Anybody with me? Am I the only one here? Come on. All right, there's a, a few of us. I remember when I was young, my parents wouldn't buy me nice things. I would say, I really want this jacket. All my friends have it. Right, And my mom was saying, listen, if I buy you that jacket, you're just going to leave it somewhere, and it's going to be gone in like a week. And she was right. And I kind of carried this unfortunate thing into adulthood. At one point, I wanted to get the brand new iPhone. It's right when the iPhone first came out. I don't know how long ago that was, but that iPhone 1, right? It didn't have a number on it at the time. It was just iPhone, right? The iPhone was coming out. I wanted one so bad, and my wife was like, if you buy that iPhone you're going to lose it. It's going to be gone in like a week. And she te- technically was coming from a place of truth. I was terrible about that. But I got this iPhone and I cared about it so much that I was like, I'm not going to lose this thing. And believe it or not, I didn't lose it. And that's pretty exciting. And that's just an iPhone. Imagine the kind of care we ought to have for our children. I'm proud to say I've never lost my children either. Um, <laughs> I had a car. You know the first car that you paid for with your own money? All right? The first car. You know how you care for that thing? Like you have rules. You tell your friends they're not allowed to eat in the thing. And I, I, I got one of those uh, unlimited car wash passes for my car. I ran it through the car wash every other day until the clear coat came off the thing. I mean, I, I loved it too hard. I mean, that's how much I cared for this car. And so when Scripture says that children are like a precious gift from God, it it leads us to this truth that we understand that when we've been given this reward from God, that we should care for our children. And moms, I'm telling you, they're way better at this than dads. And so let let me ask this question to Melissa. What does caring for our children like they're a gift from God look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know know you probably have all heard the phrase, uh, mama bear. Like, it, it's true. I know in our household, and I'm, I'm assuming yours too, like, it falls on me. I'm the one who, 
I, I schedule the doctor's appointments. You know, I make sure we don't miss their six-month dental cleanings, and I, I take them to all of that. And when I think about, like, just a quick example, they're caring for their physical needs. Um, when Matt was in India, Madeline, our middle daughter, had, like, a medical little emergency come up. And in one week, we had to go to four doctor's appointments while he's across the globe. Um, and, you know, they're like, okay, you need to go, the pediatrician is like, you need to go get this checked out, like, immediately. So I called to make the appointment, and they're telling me on the phone, oh, yeah, we can see her in a month. And that's when Mama Bear comes out, right? This is what us moms do. I'm like, a month? We cannot wait that long. That is not going to happen. And so, you know, the guy's like, let me, let me put you on hold and see what I can do. So he comes back, and he's like, if you want to drive an hour and a half, we have another location. You can go tomorrow. Absolutely, we will be there tomorrow, and that, that's what we do. It doesn't matter if I had to drive an hour and a half. I would have driven five hours, um, but that is just an example of how we treasure our kids so much that we are taking care of their physical needs. Um, just want to let you know, praise God, Madeline is fine. All the results came back. Um, wonderful. So, um, And then when I think about caring for their emotional needs, um, it, essentially that might even be more important, but... At the ages that my kids are now, our youngest is 11, and, you know, when, we, when I say goodnight to them and I, you know, in my head, they can now stay up later than I can hang. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, in my head, I'm like, it's going to be a quick prayer, and that I need to go crash in bed, you know, and so I go in and I pray with them, and then it's not always, but it's at those moments where they come up with the deepest theological question that they want to discuss something. And I'm like, okay, God, give me strength. Um, and, but that's what we do. We take those moments as opportunities to pour into them the truth of God's word, to show them, hey, you are such a priority to me that I'm going to care for your emotional needs in, in the best way that I can through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, those are really powerful. Not even just the theological questions. It's a question about a boy or a question about a friend or a question about and tears and all those things. And I'm telling you what, if, if I had been in charge when this whole thing went down with Madeline, I wouldn't be able to tell you that the results came back clear because our appointment would be in two weeks, right? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Um, like there's just, I, I don't, um, I don't, I'm not, I don't apologize when I say this. I, I say this proudly as a church. We believe that there's a profound difference between men and women. That God has created men and women uniquely different. And, and, and in general, uh, this isn't true in every case, but in general, women have been just given so much more compassion and patience and the tenderness than, than their counterparts. And Listen, dudes, come back on Father's Day. You've got some cool things about you too, but when it comes, when it comes to, to, to mothering, there's something really special about the fact that God's made us different. And the way that a mother cares for her children on those ordinary days is so important. And while I'm stepping on some toes, uh, Melissa, would you read Proverbs 31? Uh, there's a, a 15 through like 27. Sure. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household. She is energetic and strong, a hard worker. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. And I read a passage like that, and I, I know I can say this about my wife, and I'm sure the other husbands could say this about their wives. I'm telling you, my wife suffers nothing from laziness. Um, now, she doesn't spin thread and build a clothing for our children. Um, so we need to work on that, I think. But, um, <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> now, what this verse is saying is that there's something special about the way moms have been been given this incredible gift of a, of a, of a, a passion and a, a challenge and a, a job, a, a role from God to be able to provide on the ordinary days for their children's physical and emotional needs. Mm -hmm. Melissa, why do you think something like a passage like what's on the screen is so offensive to so many people? Yeah, sure. Um, no, no doubt motherhood is 
um, it is a divine calling from God. And it, as a woman, it is our, like Jess was saying, like our highest responsibility um, next to being a wife. And yet the world tells us the exact opposite, right? The world likes to just say, oh, there's no value in that. Like, don't pour into your kids. Go and make something of yourself and make your name great. And, and for what? We know this, this earth is just, it's like a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. And so as, as women of the word, we need to recognize the truth that, and not buy into the lie, recognize that we need to be investing in eternal things investing in um, building up our kids to be champions for Christ so we can leave, you know, a legacy that lasts forever um, behind us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on those ordinary days, caring for the physical and emotional needs of children is another thing that mothers, you guys do so well, and we're so thankful. Here's the third thing. Another role that matters on an ordinary day is the role of guidance, of, uh, to guide and so this guiding, what I'm talking about here is it's, it's this kind of guiding that you walk alongside your children to show them the way that they're supposed to go. And so that one day you can take a step back and watch them continue to walk along the path that you've shown them and that they could do that on their own. And so Sheila, when I um, think about this idea of guidance, you're unique on this panel in that you've had the role of, of now being a grandmother. So you have an adult daughter and you've been able to pour into her and then see how what you've given to her, the guidance you've provided, how that reflects in her own mothering. And so I wanted to ask you, um, first, would you, would you read Proverbs 22, verse 6? Sure. Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. And so when you think of this, this concept of directing your children onto the right path, so that when they're older, they will not leave it. I wanted to ask you, uh, how, how did this guidance look like? Uh, what did it look like in your family when your daughter was younger? Um, you know, we spend a lot of time together, praying together, praying for her, um, just modeling unconditional love and um, teaching her to respect others. You know, morals and value were important. Mm. especially coming from the Caribbean, the culture there. And, um, you know, in church, finding family that have the same faith and same belief, Christian camp, uh, Sunday school, you know, a lot of different things. And, um, you know, I realized that God, um, she was the most important gift mm. in my life. Yeah, I, um, I love that you added to this truth that when you guide your children, you're not only guiding them on your own, but you're guiding them to other people who can also help guide them, right? People within the body of Christ who can walk alongside this journey with them as well. So Sheila, one, one more question for you before you pass the mic. Have you seen the fruits of this? I guess another way of saying this is your daughter following Jesus, and how is that reflecting now into your family history. Yes, um, she is, and um, it's amazing to see the young woman um, she become, and um, even, you know, here in church, you know, um, one of the great joy that I see is if I'm standing around the church and just see her and her family coming into church and following the Lord, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. every mom wants to know that their children living for the Lord. And um, especially, you know, seeing the way she treat the kid, praying with them, you know, um, I have, like you said, I have three grandkids. I got two boys, they're awful. <laughs> <laughs> boys are hard, it's, it's terrible, and I just see. <laughs> She was perfect, but I just see her, you know, I just see the love that she pours into them and the patience, the wisdom, especially the 16 year old. He's not here right now, but it's. Thank you know, goodness. And, um, and then, you know, um, 
her husband, you know, um, him seeing her example and um, following Christ and being here so in church and following the Lord. So it's just amazing to see the reward of the things that God has put into you that you put into them. Hmm. I'm going to go on to our fourth role that matters, and it's to build. It's to encourage and teach our children in godliness. And, and one of the, I have an example, an illustration, maybe you've heard this before, but a guy walks up and he sees three different uh, bricklayers, three masons, and they're, they're doing their job. They're all kind of next to each other. And he goes up to the first guy and says, what are you doing? And that guy says, I'm laying bricks. Completely honest answer. That is what he's doing, right? You go up to the second guy and say, well, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a wall. Another perspective, but still an honest answer. And yet, when when he asks the third guy what he's doing, he says, I'm building a beautiful cathedral. You notice how all those answers are accurate, but one of them has a beautiful reflection of something bigger. That guy was able to understand his role in something that's much bigger than himself. And when we think about building our children up, I want to ask Michelle, would you answer this question? What, uh, what are you building? So ultimately, as mothers, as parents, we are building a legacy. Um, not a worldly one, but a godly one. Something that they can stand on, that they can look back at. And that starts off by laying your biblical foundation. Um, teaching them what Christ is like and to be men and women of God. And this ultimately means having those rough conversations with them that are uncomfortable to you because I guarantee you, if you're not telling them first, they're gonna learn it from somebody else and it's not gonna be the godly way that you would want it to be. Um, And that also means that if you're not teaching them about God, someone else will teach them everything that God isn't. And I say that when I want to build my legacy, I would want to start off with Maddie being up here and not down here. And what I mean by that is when you're in a crowd and you're standing and you're short like me, you can't see anything other than the two, three people in front of you. But if I were to stand on someone's shoulders, I could see way more. And I want that for Maddie. I would want her to be standing on my shoulders to see and do much more that I was able to do and um, to learn from my experiences and to be able to just do what God has called her to do. And to do that, you have to impart wisdom to them and um, showing her and teaching her what a righteous life is like and um, building her confidence. And And this is really big because words can either build you up or tear you down completely. And especially at her age, it will just resonate throughout the rest of her life of if I were to talk down to her, if I were to just say negative things to her on a daily basis, that's going to live with her. Um, Showing her what a Proverbs wife is and showing her how to treat Michael, how to respond and interact with different people, how to worship God, how to um, just love Jesus and in the way that God intended her to be. Yeah. And so instead of looking at uh, mothering at like a a 24-hour period being a brick, right? Instead of just laying a brick and then laying another brick and then laying another brick, what you really recognize is you're creating men of God and women of God. And that's the task that God has in front of you. And it's so cool to hear your perspective on that. Uh, Michelle, would you read um, Proverbs 6, verses 20 through 23? says, my son, obey your father's commands and don't neglect your mother's instruction. Keep their words always in your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When you wake up, they will advise you. For their command is a lamp and their instruction a light. Their corrective discipline is the way to life. Mm. So good. Melissa, could you share a a short Uh, example of what that looks like for our girls? Yeah, um, real quick. So when the girls were little, I would um, make like homemade biscuits, partly because, you know, baking with your kids is fun, and I never had like extra ingredients on hand, so you can always make biscuits. So we'd make biscuits and enjoy eating them with butter and jelly, and it was just a fun little treat. Well, so now, 
fast forward several years, the girls now do way more baking than I do. So this last week, Madeline made a batch of homemade biscuits and she um, offered me one and she was like, mama, she was like, I think I did it. And I'm like, did what? And she was like, I nailed it. She was like, I, I think I make better biscuits than you do. <laughs> And that is what we want, not with biscuits, right? But I want, we want our kids to, to love God more. We want our kids to make a bigger impact on eternity than we could. We want them to exceed. And, and one of the greatest ways we can do that as parents is to give them, give them Jesus. We know that God's holy word, there's a verse in Deuteronomy that says, these words aren't just words, they are your life. They direct your steps. They guide you. They counsel you. They bring joy and comfort to your heart. And so getting these words in front of your kids, in their hearts and minds, is so valuable. And one of the ways we do that in our family is just by taking time to memorize scripture. Um, we have five chapters in Psalms that we want each of our girls, and, and actually we memorize as well, we want them to be able to recite by the time they graduate high school. So it's Psalm 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 23, Psalm 100, and Psalm 121. And because I'm going to fail them. I, I'm, there's going to be days where I give them bad advice. I'm human. I'm going to mess up. But I can give them these words that I know will never fail them. Hmm. Man, you all are amazing. And... Uh... On the ordinary days, the days that matter, I think it's when the, the, the love and the care and the guidance and the building are, are really shining through. So can we, can we thank our mothers? <laughs> if I could share uh, kind of one final exhortation of encouragement to you all and to the mothers in this room, it would be this. Uh, listen, don't worry about all the hype and the pressure of mothering that you see and, and gather on social media. The, the thing I'd want to challenge you to do is to be extraordinary on the ordinary days. Be extraordinary on the ordinary days. There's a, if you want to know what a win looks like at the end of all this, when you look back and you figure out, how did I do? Here's, here's a verse. 3 John 1.4 says, I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. That's what it looks like. And that, that happens when you, when you mother on the ordinary days. So for our What Now God moment, um, I have a special treat for you. I've asked my sister, some of you don't know that this person's my sister, but I've asked my sister to sing a song called Ordinary Days. It's not a worship song. It's a song that she's just going to sing over the moms to encourage you today, and then we're going to dismiss. All right, let's do it. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.